filed, and we've got the uh, deputy chair of the Minnesota Republican Party, Michael Broadcorp, with us. Good morning, Michael. Welcome to KNSI. Good morning. Always a pleasure to be on, Dan. Always a pleasure, sir. Good to have you on. So um, what, what exactly is the accusation here, uh, Michael, and, and what do the Republicans want out of this deal? Well, here's, here's what we did. Um, la uh, last year, Mayor Ryback um, was running for mayor of Minneapolis, and we presented a theory to the campaign finance board uh, late last year, which is that Mayor Ryback was using funds from his mayoral campaign and was actually using those funds to campaign for governor. You're not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to take funds for a mayoral campaign and use them, uh, which, is, which is governed by different rules, and then use them to, in essence, fund a gubernatorial campaign. We presented that theory last year to the campaign finance board, and, and, and earlier this year, they agreed with us. Mm -hmm. They agreed that Ryback had been using um, mayoral funds uh, to run for governor, and he was penalized. His mayoral campaign, uh, his gubernatorial campaign, was told that he needed to pay funds back to his mayoral campaign. In essence, they also said that he had been an active candidate for governor since uh, middle of May of 2009, when, in fact, he didn't file the paperwork until much later. Mm -hmm. So what, what we discovered in reviewing Mayor Ryback's campaign finance report is that we found additional examples of where he had been using, we believe, mayoral funds to fund his campaign for governor. The advantage he would get out of this is that if he has a separate campaign committee that is governed by a different set of rules, he is able to, in essence, buy assets and buy components of his gubernatorial campaign and not use those funds, of, his, of not use those precious dollars mm -hmm. that a candidate would need to, would traditionally spend on the gubernatorial race. It is a complete circumvention of Minnesota campaign finance laws. And this specific instance involved the, the voter activation network, which is, is a voter file that the DFL provides, that sells to candidates. Ryback's mayoral campaign purchased the access to this database, this, this database which costs $13,000, he claims now for fundraising purposes, which is interesting to note because he has line items on his campaign finance report dealing with specific fundraising expenditures. So when Ryback's campaign, made it, when Ryback's campaign for mayor made expenditures related to fundraising, they designated them on their campaign finance report. Didn't do it in this instance. We think this is another example of him circumventing campaign finance laws using mayoral funds for his gubernatorial campaigns. We presented this theory to the campaign finance board. What is interesting to note here is who is now responding on behalf of Ryback's campaign. Yeah. David Lillahog is a former United States attorney. So this, the, 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 it is, I think it is really unprecedented for a, for a gubernatorial campaign to bring in a former United States attorney to help them in legal matters. I believe they know this is very serious, that there may be some trouble here, and we're waiting the board's response. Very interesting. Um, and so I, I guess the, the one of the questions I think you've already answered for me, and that is, you know, what would a Minneapolis mayor need a statewide list of Democratic voters for? Because I, I, I would believe it's a it's perfect, great question. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, a perfect example is, why did I'll answer this way? Is why did the mayor, when he was running for mayor of Minneapolis, why did he poll statewide office holders or statewide? Why did he poll statewide and specifically ask questions about a governor's campaign or about gubernatorial candidates? I should say and use the mayor's funds. What he's what, what we believe he is he has done. The campaign finance board has agreed with us on one instance, and we think this is another example. He's purposely taking funds from his gubernatorial campaign, and he's buying up assets and, and tools that he would need on his gubernatorial campaign. So he's taking a pool of money that only can be specifically used on running for mayor of Minneapolis, and he's buying up tools and assets and other goodies that he needs so he doesn't have to spend them when he runs for governor. That's against the law in Minnesota. Well, and again, there, there are spending limits. There are income, you know, fundraising and spending limits and guidelines uh, for the various uh, offices, and that's kind of what you're, what you're saying here, Michael, right? That, uh, yes, you, I mean, it, it, you can't, I mean, it's a complete circumvention of laws. There's guidelines and there's rules. You can't, if you're going to set up a campaign committee, and you're going to run for Mayor of Minneapolis, 
you have to use campaign funds to run for the mayor of Minneapolis. What would happen? It, what would happen if you believe, if you believe the logic of what Ryback has done in the past? What people could do is they could set up all these little small campaign committees, and they could just have these committees. They could establish the slush fund, and they're able to buy assets to circumvent campaign finance laws. You can't do that. You can't. You know, you can't. It's just it's a violation of law. What mm-hmm. we've seen with Democrats, we saw this with Margaret Anderson Kelleher. We've seen this with the DFL party, and we've seen it with Ryback now in, in one instance, and potentially another here, is that the ends justify the means. They're what? so hungry about raising taxes on Minnesotans and getting in that governor's seat that they're willing to thumb their nose at campaign finance laws because the ends justify the means to them. They're willing to do that because they want to win the governor's race, and they're going to thumb their nose at the laws of this state regarding campaign finance and it's wrong, and the party, Republican Party, is going to hold them accountable for it. Michael, is this still uh, the ramifications of this, if found to be, you know, they did this and they're guilty? Is it still just a financial thing, or is it, does it go beyond that? Yeah, what yeah, are the these penalties? Are not, I mean, this is, it, there's, these aren't criminal statutes. I mean, this is not, this is not criminal law. This is, so, I mean, it, it, this would be a situation of, um, I mean, I don't think they'd be going to jail, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, or get kicked out the of the race? Uh, no, I don't think that he would get kicked out of the race. I think that he would be fined mm-hmm. or penalized again by the campaign finance board. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where the, the campaign finance board can really get involved in this. Is that they can um, they can find the campaign committees, and on top of it, I mean, they and they take a PR day. I mean, at the end of the day, how you run your campaign for governor, and 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 what you do behind closed doors with your campaign staff and behind closed doors discussing campaign strategy and how you decide to circumvent campaign finance laws is a reflection how you govern at, at govern this state. What we've seen with uh, Speaker Kelleher, what we've seen with the DFL party, and what we've seen with Ryback this year is a complete willingness to circumvent the campaign laws and to establish these schemes and scenarios by which they can save money on their campaigns in violation of the law so they can run these campaigns. It's, it's very Nixonian. Very Nixonian. Wow. Uh, well, great, interesting allegations, Michael. What, what is the timeline on this? Was this something was just filed yesterday? It was filed on. Uh, okay. It was filed on. It was filed yesterday. Okay. The process for us is we need to make we need to wait for a response back from the campaign finance board okay. as to whether they're going to accept our complaint. We think it has merit. We think it's had, it, it it has merit. We think there's clear instance of where they need to look at it. We believe that they will, but obviously that's a decision up to the campaign finance board. The process will be, Dan, is that they will have a hearing then in a month or so uh, where they will discuss the allegations and they'll report back and make their findings known. The, the, the length of this will probably be you know, 30 to 60 days before we know, before, we know, um, before this process is concluded. Got to think that a lot of the other Democratic gubernatorial candidates are licking their chops at this one. There's no question <laughs> I mean, He's about pulling it. pretty no high. Question. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, this is a this, when we've seen this on, as I said, a couple of campaigns. Kelleher's campaign uh, has been fined this year. The DFL party has been fined this year, and Rabick's campaign for governor has already been was already penalized for, for their actions. And so, uh, as I said before, the ends justify the means for the Democrats. They're willing to circumvent, go around, and break campaign finance laws in order to win the governor's race. And it's just it's just it's a, the wrong approach. Minnesotans have a right to know about it, and the Republican Party is going to hold them accountable for it.